scoot up for a second and let's talk. Yo, DJ, roll that beautiful champagne footage. Welcome to Champagne Secrets, where the bubbles are crisp, the secrets are smoother than silk, and the gossip flows like the finest champagne. Big up yourself, Empress. Glasses up to the streets that never sleep and to the secrets running deep. Let's get it. Champagne Secrets. Welcome to the Secret Chalet for Wellness Waves Wednesdays. Yes. Come on in. Grab you a glass of champagne off the table. You already know I'm sipping on my Moet and Chandon. But whatever you're sipping on, go ahead and come in and grab a seat. Hit that like and subscribe button on your way in. And let's get into it. Because we need to pause and make sure our mental and emotional well-being is in check. So if you're ready, let's get into it. So on last week, we started off describing what the Heartbreak Hotel looks like, right? So we're going to do a little recap for anyone who is new to the chalet just coming in for our wellness waves wednesdays that didn't happen to catch the heartbreak hotel on last week so um in order to really get the feel for this you're gonna have to use your imagination because generally when you want to make something really live for yourself you need to form a picture of it in your mind right a clear vivid picture so we're going to describe the heartbreak hotel so this hotel is an architectural masterpiece. It stands as an embodiment of our deepest desires and dreams. But from the outside looking in, it's a breathtaking spectacle, a symbol of opulence and elegance and the promise of endless joy. Its facade glistens under the sun, adorned with intricate details and shimmering glass windows that reflect the sky and its surrounding beauty. It's grand. It has sweeping archways that lead you to a grand entrance where magnificent chandeliers hang like radiant jewels casting warm, inviting glows. Man, the exterior gardens are meticulously manicured with vibrant and fragrant flowers in full bloom, winding pathways and fountains that dance to the melodies of the wind. <sighs> guess, I, guess who approached the hotel? Approach it with hope and excitement, captivated by its resplendent exterior, which stands as an embodiment of everything we thought we ever wanted. When they enter, the guests are greeted by a vast marble lobby. It's adorned with artwork and elegant furnishings. The scent of fresh flowers, lavender and vanilla just linger all throughout the air. Soft, soothing music plays in the background. Friendly, impeccably dressed staff offer warm smiles, promising to make your stay unforgettable. The rooms are luxurious, furnished with the finest material and designer decor. Each room a work of art, carefully designed to cater to your every desire. Plush oversized beds with high thread count linens invite you to sink into their embrace. Floor to ceiling windows that offer panoramic views of a paradise that seems too good to be true. But as you settle in to your beautiful room and the doors slowly close and lock behind you, you start to see the truth that the Heartbreak Hotel with this stunning exterior and lavish decor is merely a facade. The beauty and luxury it promises are empty and cold. It's like a mirage in the desert the rooms reveal a different reality where the opulence disguises a profound sense of despair and the reality of where you are finally sets in. The Heartbreak Hotel isn't just a catchy name, it's a trap, one that you've placed yourself in 
and one that you will have to get yourself out of. So now we have an idea, right, of what this hotel looks like. The hotel is a metaphor for the places that we've emotionally and mentally checked into but can't seem to check out of. We allow what we call love to get us trapped in a place that our heart can't get us out of. And now we're depressed and stressed and emotional and we can't seem to get ourselves together because we've checked in heart first and not head first. So then we proceeded to talk about the three things that get us trapped here, right? The thought trap or how we think, which is the emotional vortex that whirlwind of emotions that can overwhelm us and make us feel trapped, stuck in our head and thoughts and in our heart, our emotions. And the third is the circumstantial quicksand because sometimes our circumstances get us stuck here because our circumstances make us feel forced to settle for where we are instead of reaching for greater. And if we would just get our EQ, our emotional IQ in check, we'll be able to figure out our circumstances because we'll be able to think clearly. When you develop a thought about something and dwell on that thought for too long, that thought will breed an emotion. And if you dwell on that emotion for long enough, that emotion will breed thoughts in other areas based on that emotion, right? Let me give you an example. So, you are in a relationship and they really dogged you out, right? I mean, dogged you out to the point that they left you broken. They cheated. They used you. They, I mean, just dogged you out, right? So, now you have a thought in your head about that individual because of what you went through, which provoked emotions based on the thoughts you developed from what you went through with this person. So, now someone else comes into your life or tries to come into your life and automatically what you went through comes back to the surface and you begin to look at or see them through the eyes of that same hurt and now everybody is a dog all men are dogs because the one that you dated barked now you can't trust nobody because those emotions have spilled over into every relationship you get into Or they keep you from a good relationship because the pain becomes stronger than your power and your hurt becomes stronger than the love. You get it? Emotions are very fluid. They move like water and they shift constantly when you don't have them under control. So the first room that we discussed is the loneliness lounge. We talked about this room being like a vacuum for your soul, suffocating you and making you feel like you're the only person on the planet. Like you're trapped in this vast emotional desert that you can't seem to see your way out of. To make it live for you, imagine this room being dimly lit, dull and drab with shadows like apparitions cast across the walls. The air feels stale as if the world has come to a halt and time itself has come to a standstill. This silence isn't a normal silence. It's eerie, it's thick, and it's deafening. The furniture that was once bright has transformed and become faded and you're left alone with nothing but yourself, your thoughts, your memories, and your emotions. You're left isolated and feeling like you're not good enough for anything outside of where you currently are. Then we spoke about how to get out of this room. Self-reflection. Turning the mirror on self and taking a look at how you ended up here. Because you accepted the key. You got to always remember that. You don't get to choose your rooms. The hotel chooses the room for you based on the condition that you came in in. Can you imagine going to a hotel and asking for a room and then you pay for the room because you felt like this is a opulent and elegant hotel so you figure all the rooms are the same just to get there and you don't get to choose your own room? The hotel chooses the room for you? 
Well, that's how the Heartbreak Hotel is. So you need self-reflection. You need to take a moment to take a look at yourself. And then you need honesty. You got to ask yourself, was it partly my fault? Was I somehow a contributor to the reason why the relationship met its demise? Was it partly my fault? If it was, forgive yourself. And if it wasn't, forgive them. You don't have to remain captive to your emotions, afraid to be all one. We've gotten to this place where we've we've become so addicted to having someone else that we don't know how to be all one. We don't know how to be okay with being by ourselves and with ourselves. Why is it that we feel like we just have to have somebody and we pour more into those somebodies than we pour into ourselves? Take the time to get to know you. We don't know who we are. We know who our significant others are more than we know ourselves and that's why we fall. It is because we don't know our triggers. We don't know what makes us truly happy. We're just settling for a facade. Have you ever heard someone say, fake it until you make it? Yeah. When are you going to get tired of faking it and really be happy? Because that's what it's time for. It's time to learn how to truly be happy, not with someone else, but with yourself. Take the time to learn your value. Why don't we know our worth? So many of us are talking about we're high value, but we're putting that value into the hands of trash. Would you hand a Fabergé egg to a homeless person and tell them to hold on to it for you? Would you give the Hope Diamond to a stranger and tell them to hold it while you grab something out of your pocket? No! Then why do you keep putting your heart in the hands of individuals who haven't proven to you that they can handle its worth? You got to be stronger than that. You have to be because we're constantly compiling hurt upon hurt upon hurt upon heartbreak upon heartbreak and trying to figure out why we got here, how we got here, and why we feel like we're so weighted down with pressure. It's because we are. We've placed ourselves here. So now we've come to this week. And this week, we're talking about bitterness, Uh uh-huh, because a lot of us are just bitter. We wouldn't know how to be happy if it slapped us in the face and offered us a thousand dollars to be. We're bitter, we're angry, and we found ourselves in this double suite, the anger in, which is attached to hate chambers. So first, let's step into the anger in. Picture a suite ablaze with fiery fuse, right? Bright, bold, vivacious reds and oranges. The walls are painted in shades of burning crimson and furnishings that seem to vibrate with the energy of a raging storm, right? The air crackles with electric tension, mirroring the intensity of emotions that surges within its confines. Even the mirrors on the walls reflect the fury in your eyes, amplifying the raw power of your anger. The minute you settle into this room, the energy makes you want to scream, fight, attack, something, anything, everything. Have you ever been around someone that's in full-blown rage? Do you remember how it made you feel that energy, that electricity that pulsated off of them? Because angry people are impulsive. They never respond. They always react. And people full of bitterness and anger are dangerous because it, because in the heat of rage, you don't care. See, I like watching Investigation Discovery, right? Have you ever watched the show Snapped? That's what can happen when you're enraged. You're like a Tasmanian devil destroying everything in your path. It doesn't matter who it is. You don't care. You're enraged. You can't see or think past the anger. You can snap and you won't realize what was done until the rage calms down. And then you're left to deal with the devastation that you've caused. Your journey to the anger in 
often begins when you feel wronged or betrayed or don't know how to process it. Injustice can also spark a flame of anger, right? And this sweet is like a crucible where emotions ignite like a roaring inferno. So let's take it away from relationships, right? Do you remember when the term going postal was coined? When people began to bang up their jobs because they were fired? See, that's rage, unbridled anger. The allure of anger lies in its power to protect your wounded heart. It serves or it its facade serves as a defense mechanism against the world's injustices. When you're in the anger end, you feel like a volcano on the verge of eruption. You're consumed by a fiery anger that feels like it's surging or coursing through your veins. It's a relentless burning sensation that courses through your body making your heart race and your muscles tense. Your mind becomes a battleground of turbulent thoughts, each one more infuriating than the last. You might even feel a pounding in your chest. Your hands begin to tremble with the intensity of your emotions. It's as if a raging storm is within you and every interaction, every memory, feels like a lightning bolt of frustration. The anger end magnifies the injustices you faced and intensifies your desire for retribution and vindication. Listen, I have a temper, right? But I had to teach myself to remove those triggers so they're not easily tripped. But when I'm getting to a place of anger or rage, it's like I can feel my blood begin to boil. (laughs) It's like it starts at my toes and starts to slowly creep its way up. You remember the old Incredible Hulk episodes when David Banner would say, don't make me angry. You wouldn't like me if I got angry. Yeah, that that's me. <laughs> and I know that it's not good for me because my thoughts go from roses and cattle lilies to penitentiary like automatically. They go from champagne to Mad Dog 2020 <laughs> to 1800 hard liquor. But but we gotta stop because what ship do you know has ever lasted long on a turbulent sea? It can't unless you've proofed it to handle it. And most of us aren't offense proof. We aren't. I still am not. We don't spend enough time offense-proofing our lives against the turbulence of life. So this room is characterized by a sense of isolation and hostility. So a lot of times you push people away. The rage within you creates a wall that feels impenetrable. Diamond-encrusted, thorn-filled walls guarded by pit bulls, electrical wire fences. And that's why every response they give is almost a snap. They're just real snappy, like you just call them ugly or something. Everything is a snap. Not a positive word comes from their mouths. You might feel like you're trapped in a burning building and your instinct is to push everyone out for your safety, even if it's your own emotional well-being that's truly at risk. Visitors in the Anger Inn often find themselves oscillating between brooding over past wrongs and plotting retaliation. All they want is to get back. They want to get back at everybody who's hurt them. This is how you get broken car windows and slashed tires and destroyed property. Y'all have seen these videos all over YouTube. It's uncontrolled anger and rage. Now let's cross the threshold to the hate chambers. Because if we don't get rage under control, rage turns into hate. And that's why these two rooms are connected. Here, the atmosphere is even more ominous. The walls are painted in a dark black. I mean, blacker than black. Almost like they aren't even there, it's so black. It seems to absorb any hint of light. Broken fragments of what could have been beautiful art are scattered throughout mirroring shattered dreams and fractured relationships, the ones that led you here. The air resonates with negativity and the room seems to carry the scent of acrid bitterness. 
Distorted mirrors reflect back distorted versions of yourself, intensifying feelings of resentment and anger. Every time you look at yourself, all you see is hate and pain, and you hate the pain, so you hate the causer of it. Within the hate chambers, emotions are like a heavy, suffocating fog, obscuring the path to understanding and forgiveness. It's as if a storm cloud has taken residence in your heart, casting a shadow over every aspect of your existence. Every breath feels like a burden. You hate that you're even breathing the same air as the person who hurt you. And your thoughts are relentless. I mean evil, dark, whispering dark thoughts of vengeance. Visitors find themselves in the hate chambers when anger festers and transform into an overwhelming hatred. It's the room where negativity thrives and the walls appear to appear to absorb bitterness, trapping individuals in a never-ending cycle of self-destructive thoughts and emotions. Because there is no light, guests of the hate chambers are not only a danger to others, they are a danger to themselves. There's no light in this room, so there's no vision. You can't see your way around, so you create bigger messes by bumping into things you can't see. And because you've been in the, in the dark so long, you've gotten used to the darkness and damage. You no longer care what it looks like in the light. You don't even care that you're angry any longer, Smeagol. You're just trapped. You hate you're alone. You hate the dark, but you also hate the light. Why does anything have this much power over you? People who are full of hate have no feeling. And that's why we end up with people being unalived when they break up with them. Because someone allowed anger to fester and fester and fester until it turned into hate. Where you feel nothing and become capable of anything. Because absent of emotion is absent of remorse. Which means you are capable of absolutely anything. Do you want to know how to get out of these suites? Because you thought your anger and hatred would bring you some kind of power. But look at where you are. Alone. In the dark. Bitter. Broken. Empty. Void. Hatred isn't empowering. It's draining. It's draining to have to hold on to that emotion every time you see a person. Or every time you have a thought about that person in a conversation. And here comes the void again. Here comes the darkness like a horror movie and the monster is possessing you. So in order to get out of this place, you have to confront it. You have to. You have to confront it. You cannot conquer what you will not confront. So let me take you through an exercise. This is an exercise that I take my clients through when I have a vision session with them. And this is what I want you to do. I need you to close your eyes and I need you to see it. Whatever you're mad at, whatever you're angry at, I need you to see it. I need you to give it a face and give it a name. I need you to see what made you mad. Don't hold back because we're going to let this go. We're gonna get past it because this room isn't safe. I need you to see it. See what was done. I need you to hear what was said and I need you to see it and hear it vividly. Now I need you to do something that no one has probably given you permission to do. I need you to feel it. Feel every ounce of it. How did it make you feel when they said what they said and when they did what they did? I need you to feel it. Did you go through several emotions before you got here? I need you to feel all of them. Feel the sadness. Feel the pain. Feel the hurt. Feel the isolation. Are you there? Angry? Frustrated? Now, I need you to take some deep breaths while you're right there. Four seconds in. Hold it. Four seconds out. Keep breathing and tell yourself it's not real. This is a memory. It was real then, 
but it can no longer hurt you. It can no longer affect you. Tell it it no longer has power over you. Tell it I release you and I reclaim my power. Tell it, breathe it, feel it. I don't care if you have to cry. I don't care if you have to pause and scream. I need you to release it. Let it go. With every exhale, I need you to let more and more of it go. Then, I need you to tell it, I forgive you. I forgive you. And I need you to forgive yourself. And I need you to mean it. With each breath, I need you to see it fade away along with the pain of it. Feel it lift and let go. If you're really ready to leave this place, baby, you got to let it go. All of the hurt, all of the pain, everything attached to that moment in time, I need you to let it go and I need you to forgive because forgiveness is not for them because they're living their lives. Forgiveness is for you because you're the one stuck. You're the one stuck with the pain, with the misery, with the grudges, with the memories. Baby, you got to let it go so you can live. Listen, I've learned not to hold on to grudges because it doesn't benefit me. I have learned to believe what people show me and move differently. It's not that I don't remember what was done. I just refuse to hold on to it long enough to allow it to deter my future. I don't have to hate you or dislike you. I just have to move different around you. Listen, let me show you something. I love wearing jewelry that are snakes, right? I love snake jewelry, I do. I think snakes are some of the most beautiful creatures ever. But a snake is a snake. And I wear it because it's a lesson. It's a lesson. It's a lesson because a snake doesn't try to be anything else but what it is. So no matter how beautiful it is, because some of them are absolutely gorgeous in color, if it were real and I decided to pick it up and it bites me, I can't get mad at it because it didn't hide what it is. I knew what it was when I picked it up. When you get tuned in with your star player, as I continue to talk about, number one, you'll stop investing so much of yourself into something without knowing what it is. And number two, you'll stop holding yourself captive to what somebody else did or said. Learn how to shake it off. Get you some anti-venom called self-love and move on. The best get back you can ever give to someone who has maliciously hurt you is to let them see you move on, unbothered, unwavered, living your life, getting to your bag, picking yourself up, and doing better for yourself. Claim your peace so you can chase your destiny. Next week, we'll be talking about the self-loathing chambers and insecurity in, uh, Because a lot of us have hidden and outward insecurities that we need to let go of so that we can be the greatest version of ourselves possible. So tune in to Wellness Waves Wednesdays on next week so that we can see how to escape the self-loathing chambers and insecurity in. I hope you enjoyed this week. Confidence. Remember, if it doesn't cause you to elevate, it's causing you to depreciate. Now raise those glasses, clink, and let's drink till we meet again. Ta-ta.